Hello, folks, and welcome to episode 11 of Platform Enterprise, the show that platforms projects which empower. I'm your host, Rachel Donald, and alongside this podcast, I write the Platform Enterprise newsletter, which is an investigation into the policies and corruption which keep the world in crisis. You can subscribe to get both the podcast and the newsletter to your inbox every week at www.platformenterprise.com. All the newsletters and episodes are available on a free subscription. But as I write every week, if you like it, share it. If you love it, upgrade. On the show this week is Matt Peterson, a founding member of Woodbine in New York City. Woodbine is one of those great examples of a community self-organizing to meet its own needs. Matt discusses just how important spaces like these are, giving the pertinent example of Woodbine's role to provide COVID-19 relief when local and federal government failed its constituents. This is a fascinating conversation on community, governance, and even the future of politics. And we would love to know what you think. So leave a rating, leave a comment, or head on over to www.platformenterprise.com to get the discussion going. Thank you very much for joining me today, Matt. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. For people that might not have heard of Woodbine, would you please give some background to the project? Sure. So Woodbine is a space in New York City, and it's in Queens, which is one of the so-called outer boroughs of New York surrounding Manhattan. And it's in a neighborhood called Ridgewood, which is a kind of working class, multi-ethnic immigrant neighborhood. And I mentioned that because, you know, in the last 10, 20 years, a lot of things that would previously have been in Manhattan, kind of downtown lower Manhattan, have been pushed out to outer parts of New York and Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, or even New Jersey. And, you know, Woodbine is one of those things. So it was a space that a group of people, friends started together in Ridgewood, Queens, where a lot of us moved at the time we started the space. So it's kind of an attempt to have a kind of village communal life or sensibility inside of New York City, you know, while staying in New York. So not necessarily like leaving the city or going back to the land, so to speak, but trying to think about how can we both stay in New York City, but kind of share life together, share kind of things and experiments together in a kind of localized, dense way. So we started it at the end of 2013. So now, you know, it's we're entering the eighth year, I guess. And, you know, to maintain a non-commercial, non-institutional space in New York City, you know, which is some of the highest real estate in, in, the, in the U.S., it's been an accomplishment and, you know, it's involved dozens of people kind of collaborating and organizing to keep it going. And, you know, obviously since COVID, that's been a whole other dynamic. Mm, right. Okay. Of course. You know, I hadn't even thought about that with everything that's going on about all of the nonprofit spaces that might be struggling because of the lack of ability to raise funds. May I ask, how did you raise the, the initial funds to start the project? Uh, initially, actually, some artists who are friends of ours and supporters of, you know, the group of people who started it contributed or donated some seed money basically to, to pay for the, uh, the initial rent or security deposit or help us buy some of the initial supplies. But, it, you know, it wasn't very much. It was maybe a few thousand dollars. But that helped because, you know, people individually didn't have the money and, you know, it was hard to pool it. So having that initial seed was important mm -hmm. to kind of give us the confidence to get it going. And then for the first couple of years, it was mostly funded out of pocket, you know, by the collective, by the people who were running it. Wow. So say, you know, the rent was around $1,300 a month. This was, you know, eight years ago, which isn't very much. A dozen people or so could put in $100 each and, and figure that out, could pay that. And that kind of allowed us not to always be in kind of fundraising or crisis mode. You know, if we knew mm -hmm. we could pay for the the bills and expenses ourselves, it took some pressure off of us and then allowed us basically to do what we want. You know, we could program whatever we wanted or we didn't have to be beholden to other tenants or other kind of concerns or we didn't have to compromise the kind of programming we did at the space, you know, but all of that sort of evolved over the years. But, you know, that was the initial model. And how has it evolved over the years? I mean, what did it start as exactly? You say village life, it would be interesting to have a clearer definition of what you mean exactly for you. And then what has it be become, you know, in the past seven, eight years? 
I mean, the background, you know, in New York City, there's about 8 million people who live within the city itself and about 20 million or more who live in the metropolitan area. And in the city is quite big. You know, it's five different boroughs, each of which is maybe comparable to a, its own small city, you know, each of which has, you know, a million or two people inside of it. So like as as I was saying, you know, the city, the cultural geography of the city in the last 10, 20, 30 years became really diffuse because people were pushed out of what before was this kind of countercultural zone of lower Manhattan, you know, downtown Manhattan, you know, now people were pushed and spread out all throughout the city. So, you know, a lot of us and friends and comrades might live, you know, an hour away from each other, you know, on the train or a bus, mm -hmm. which then meant it was difficult to see each other. It was a pain in the ass. People were tired or lazy from work or school and didn't want to sit on two trains for an hour so that you know it meant it was harder to collaborate you know politically or culturally or socially just because the logistics of it you know the real estate logistics and infrastructure made it so difficult just to simply see each other never mind work on something together so mm -hmm. part of the idea or concept of, of woodbine and moving to ridgewood was that we would all concentrate ourselves in one neighborhood and mostly live within walking distance of each other. And that's sort of what I mean by the village life, you know, so we didn't all live in one house, you know, cause that comes with its own set of difficulties and contradictions. You know, we had so-called, you know, regular apartments, you know, with two or three people each, four people, but they were all near each other, you know, within a few blocks away of each other. And then Woodbine was a physical space that we rented in common which became kind of like a shared living room where we would kind of gather and meet and, and have meals together and have, you know, screenings or discussions or events or talks, or we would physically store, build things there. So that was basically the, the main, you know, experiment from an, on an urban level or kind of infrastructurally was to, to uproot all of our apartments and live in the same neighborhood and then have this, central location be a, a hub or a headquarters for all the things we were trying to do and then once we were able to kind of start that and build that as a foundation it enabled us to do different kinds of you know projects in the neighborhood and different kinds of programming at the space as as an event space and you know affected our you know daily lives the rhythm of our lives you know how we were able to see each other and share spend time together okay and how has that changed your life individually? Before we go in more into the space about Woodbine, having that village within a city, what, what's it done for you? I mean, I think, you know, cyclically, psychically, like I was saying, you know, it can be when you live in an apartment where you're not near a lot of your friends or you're kind of just isolated, you know, in, in some neighborhood just because maybe you found a, a cheap deal or, you know, cheap rent or it, the apartment itself might be nice, but it's in an area that might be kind of a bit alien or foreign to you, you know, the, that it's literally isolating and that can be a bit depressing or frustrating. And it, it strips a lot of spontaneity around, you know, your social life where you can't necessarily just walk and see your friend or go to a, a bar or have, have food together, or kind of, you know, everything has to be kind of planned out and scheduled. And, you know, it's just so complicated or difficult or annoying to see each other in a, in a large city like that. So I think, you know, socially and therefore, you know, people's, I think, emotional or mental health really shifted when it was so much more comfortable or easy just to kind of have friends nearby. I mean, it sounds kind of alien the way I'm describing it now, to, you know, but I think there is that dystopic aspect of New York City, you know, where people, and, and this is definitely true during COVID, people that maybe lived in some neighborhood because they had an, a nice or a cheap apartment, but didn't have really friends or social ties, once COVID happened and there was quarantine and people weren't really going to work or school or taking the train or the bus, they were really just stuck inside. You know, they were kind of locked inside their house and there was no real way for them to engage with other humans. And I think a lot of people experienced that and then kind of reflected on this experiment that we had been trying to do 
with Woodbanya and Ridgewood that we didn't have that. You know, once there was so-called quarantine, it didn't really affect us that much because we were already so close to each other and had the the physical location that we were able to kind of really organize really quickly and, you know, be able to to build a kind of mutual aid, you know, hub or, or group organization because we already had a lot of social ties to the area and they were all really hyper localized. You know, I'm from New York. I grew up in New York, but this experience in Ridgewood really gave me much more of a foundation. It gave me something, you know, something to build on and, and have a different longevity or temporality or trajectory of the things that you're doing when, you know, you know, you're not just going to move in a year or two because you're pushed out or forced out or everything, you know, is the same as anything else. Yeah, I, I really relate to what you're saying, actually, because in the, the brief time, just a year that I lived in London, I was working uh, in a bar that my my friend and neighbor, uh, he was the assistant manager. And the bar was owned by this really, really eccentric guy who was loaded and didn't really need any money coming from it. So there was no kind of chain of hierarchy or things that needed to be done. And what we found was that it just became a hub for for our friends. The, the bar became our living room because there was always one of us on shift. And I brought another friend from outside, you know, that group who lived in a different area of London. I, I brought him in one day and he was astounded at the fact that everybody was talking to each other. And that when we walked in, we had to say hello to 20 different people. And he said, I've never seen this before in London. I've never seen this kind of like close contact community before. And I've lived here for 30 years. And I thought it was really, really special. And it was very, very difficult to leave when, when I did have to leave. Because it, you know, what you're saying, it gave a certain foundation and concretization to, to, to life there, having those social ties. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think, you know, there's, a, you know, these cities like, you know, London and New York, especially are two probably the, the main examples, but other kind of large you know, mega cities, these major, you know, cosmopolitan projects, there's a lot of reasons why we do want to stay in them and maintain connections to them and ties, you know, politically, culturally, socially, because what well, just simply there's so many people there and that that breeds a lot of potential and possibility. But yeah, like you're saying, you're often balancing that and negotiating that with a pretty devastating kind of precarity, isolation, alienation. And that was one of the things we tried to address together as a kind of form of organizing or political goal or agenda was to how can we stay in New York City, but kind of confront or deal with all these aspects that make living in a city like London or New York or wherever so difficult and frustrating, especially for people who are just moving there that maybe don't have already the social ties or group or connections or friendships. And, you know, they have maybe a set of interests, you know, culturally, politically, whatever, but they don't really know how to embed themselves in a community or, or find a community or something. And that was really what we were trying explicitly to do, especially during COVID, we were really able to respond and, and meet the moment in a way that I feel proud of. So tell me about the kind of community that is now at Woodbine, because as far as I can see yeah, from my from my research, it's not just the 12 of you anymore. It's become something quite big and quite embedded in the local community, right? Right. I mean, you know, over the year, you know, one of the aspects of New York, like, you know, these cities that we're talking about is a lot of people come and a lot of people leave and there's a kind of big turnover, New York or London, especially, you know, there's all these people coming and going. So there's a lot of flux and people come for school or work or, you know, move to somewhere else. There's always this dynamic where it feels like a lot of expats are just associating with other expats or a lot of people not from New York, you know, so for myself or some of us who are actually from New York, that was always a challenge or difficulty because if people aren't from here, they don't necessarily have that investment in staying or maintaining or building it. All that to say, you know, so there's been, you know, dozens of people involved in Woodbine, the, you know, the group or collective since we started. And it's been kind of a, a rotating group. You know, there's a few of us still around who've been here 
since the beginning, but it's really evolved and shifted a lot, you know, over the years. At the beginning of COVID, a lot of people left New York City, you know, for health reasons or social reasons, you know, the reasons like we were talking about before, they were stuck in a small apartment in a neighborhood where maybe they didn't know anyone and that just felt miserable or shitty. So they left. But, you know, those, you know, a number of people either couldn't leave or didn't want to leave or decided to stay. And then we kind of committed ourselves to figuring out how to make it, you know, possible for us to stay and also how to organize ourselves to make sure that the community or the neighborhood was sort of taken care of and was able to kind of get by because of, you know, the government or economic, you know, response was so poor and, and continues to be so, you know, derelict or negligent. So maybe now there's there's probably around, you know, 40 or 50 people that help us run, you know, the food pantry at Woodbine. And there's probably a pool of, you know, 100, 200 people that have kind of contributed or volunteered, you know, so to speak, in a meaningful way in the last year. You know, and that that's huge. That really kind of blew up or grew our community and organization and, and how we relate to the space and each other. You know, someone who's come in a week ago versus a month ago versus a year ago versus five years ago. How do those people collaborate or interact and share knowledge and experience and, you know, things that they've learned along the way? You know, that's something we're trying to think about and figure out now. And then also the broader goals or vision of the project, you know, conceptually or politically or whatever. How do we both maintain that from the beginning, but also be open to like evolve and experiment and rethink you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it and how it relates to the neighborhood or the city or the time. So all these things are always sort of in flux. And then part of the project itself is to kind of be a bit more fluid and flexible. We're not a formal organization, you know, we're not a nonprofit organization. There's no legal entity, you know, called Woodbine. It's always just a kind of free association of people, you know, which has its own contradictions or limitations. Could you talk about the the difficulties that you find organizing? Because <clears throat> I'm particularly interested in in that 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 question at the moment because I think that there there are so many fantastic projects out there in the world and something that does happen of course is projects evolve and people evolve and as you say there's this turnover and discussions have to be made, had and held about how to progress and and how to grow within an evolving framework. And I think a uh, conversation about organization is extremely important, especially considering the sort of dramatic failures that we're seeing internationally of governments and local governments, as you say, failing to respond to the COVID crisis. So what do you think, what kind of difficulties do, do you encounter and what do you think bigger organizations or structures or governments even could learn from micro communities and micro economies self-organizing i mean you know there's a lot there obviously and i i'll just say like you know woodbine you know we've survived seven or eight years but i i wouldn't necessarily say we have some perfect organizational model worked out you know obviously there's been a lot of limits and frustrations and contradictions that we've run into through various you know trial and error of experimenting and also i think Part of the the need is to, to have that flexibility, though, that it's not that there's one particular organizational model that ever worked for us or that will ever work for anyone, you know, depending on the broader external conditions or the time, you know, involves that you adapt and kind of meet, you know, whatever is happening, you know, the way in which we responded to something like a hurricane is different than, you know, Black Lives Matter, which is different than you know, building a community garden or, a, you know, a, a CSA. These are all different activities that require different, you know, tasks or, you know, execution or something. And different people have different skills and interests. So I, I would say, like, you know, to be fluid and flexible and adapt is a big part of it. And that's something that larger organizations, you know, ones that have more money, ones that have, more of an institutional component have difficulty because it's harder for them to adapt because they're just too big, they're too slow. You know, Woodbine, you know, it's an all volunteer organization, which, you know, the limitation of that is that, you know, we don't have people 
full-time devoted committed but that also means you know we don't have to like constantly fire people or hire people or lay people off the economy collapsing in the last year helped because all these people just had all this free time you know they weren't bound by work it really enabled woodbine to blossom because all these people now could just think about like what what do i want to do in my local neighborhood context or in in this space another kind of just question about you know organization in terms of like logistics. So in terms of government response to something like COVID, they don't really have a lot of local neighborhood awareness. So even if they have, you know, the resources Mm -hmm. like masks or food or kind of the, the vaccine is a perfect example, you know, they don't actually know how to distribute it or how to communicate with people on a very local level. The government just really doesn't have a great mechanism to to interface with 8 million people. So in order for something like that to function, you would need, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of like small woodbines or community centers or churches historically, you know, serve this function in the US as, as these local hubs that can kind of interface with local communities and local neighbors and therefore community interface with something like a government, so to speak, or some kind of emergency response or resource kind of provider to distribute those kind of resources, you know, the the basic logistics. Part of the issue in like the neoliberal society is that a lot of these local institutions, local, you know, neighborhood institutions disappeared or were destroyed or were eradicated or because of the, the way, you know, the urban situation evolved. So what you end up with is just a city or a society of individuals that don't have, you know, the ties to each other to even know who to ask about how do I get vaccinated or how do I get a COVID test or, you know, I'm not sure if I, you know, qualify for unemployment because I had this job, you know, they don't even know who to ask. So a lot of people, especially in a city like New York, where there's so many immigrants and people's access to the English language is very difficult or, you know, the internet or the bureaucracy of the city. A lot of people don't even know where to start about how to accessing, you know, whatever resources there might be, you know, from the state or whatever. Yeah. I I think it's a very political thing in such a neoliberal society to set up, as you say, like a village, a community. It's an extremely political act. Do you think that organizations like Woodbine could be gateways for government to research their local communities or to engage with their local communities? Or do you think there could be that kind of, I was going to say private public, but it's not private public, like a state village intersection that would enable the handing out of resources, for example? I mean, I think the the goal for us isn't, you know, to go from us to the government, but to how, how do these local forms access and extract resources from the government. So we don't want to deliver our data, so to speak, to the government so the government functions better. We want to get, you know, the 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 data or resources from the government so our local entities function better. So it's maybe a different it's a different orientation. You know, our horizon isn't a centralized city government that functions better. It would be the proliferation of local communities that are able to be, you know, resilient and, and, and capable and functional or whatever. So it's uh, maybe that orientation, I think would maybe shift or differ if, if that makes sense. It, it does. I completely understand the desire and the need for, for more community led organizations. And I think, what you're doing, you know, with, with Woodbine in New York, what communitism is doing in Athens. These are fantastic examples of what can happen when a community comes together to self-organize. But do we not also still want the government to function better? Is the goal also not citizens' well-being and safety? I mean, and we want, you know, the society or the world to function better it's just not clear that in order to get there, that requires the government to function better. And right. 
you know, maybe that would be the question. You know, I think part of the dysfunctionality that we experience now in a city like New York or a country like the U.S. is that the government and, you know, the, the economic system has, has rooted out the social ties that, that will, could enable a community to be resilient or community to survive or, or kind of thrive and has sort of emptied out all of these these mechanisms and now you know unfortunately there's a lot of precarity and kind of unemployment and food insecurity you know housing insecurity and you know we think that's the government's fault you know the, the, they're not the solution to, to resolving that you know so obviously you know they still maintain all of our money, you know, through taxes, through, through the tax, you know, revenue they've accumulated. And we want to access that money, you know, to, to redistribute resources. And, but we want to have the imagination of, of where that money goes or where those resources go, or we think, you know, local communities have a better understanding of how to distrib- redistribute, you know, that wealth, so to speak, or those resources. Because, you know, I think we, we just don't trust that the government, you know, will have the local community's best interest in mind, especially, you know, immigrant working class communities that don't have a lot of wealth, that don't have a lot of lobbying power, you know, in, in a capitalist, you know, the, the, the form of capitalism, you know, in, in New York City or the U.S. is, I think, a bit different than in Europe or kind of Western Northern Europe, where there is much more of a, a safety net or kind of mechanism for the government to provide for the safety or health or well-being of its citizens i you know i think a lot of americans don't have that vision of the government you know and that's why you know i think religious organizations in the us for hundreds of years have thrived to the extent that they have because they precisely filled that gap where the government didn't mm-hmm. exist you know it was religions who built schools who built hospitals who built retirement centers who cared for the elderly who did, you know, poverty relief be- precisely because the government either couldn't or wouldn't do that. And I think that's one of the ways mm-hmm. that, you know, religious organizations have built so-called legitimacy, you know, in communities is because these various churches or houses of worship were community centers and they were, you know, provision centers to, to distribute, you know, food or clothes or medicine or health or education because the government just didn't give a shit. And I don't think a lot of Americans, you know, their horizon really on the left or the right is to give the government more power or give the government more, you know, put, you know, information or data or resources when, you know, for 250 years, they've kind of put us in the situation we find ourselves in, you know, now. That's really very interesting. And I think you're right that the the precarization in the U.S. and the the state of citizenship in the U.S. is a particularly terrible result and example of of the neoliberalism that has come to entrench Western society. But I wonder if if that is not an example of government malfunctioning. I wonder if we need to you know discuss the terms of of what functionality is i mean do you think that the local communities could and local locally organized community driven organizations could replace the, the the centralized government i mean you know i don't want to be too speculative or abstract or, or semantic about you know mm-hmm. what do we mean by government or you know governance you know what you know how does how does a mm-hmm. community or neighborhood govern each other you know the reality is you know we have a kind of hierarchical form of government you know where the city government is subservient to the state government and the state government's subservient to the federal government and you know we have this kind of bicameral legislative body that's you know formed through a kind of settler colonial process where we have 50 states but you know New York City has a higher population than, you know, a number of states in in, in the union, mm-hmm. you know, a number of states in the Midwest and the North, you know, they have, you know, about a million people in them, you know, so yeah. Queens has, has a million people in it. But, you know, the way the federal government apportions resources, if it's by state, 
you know, somewhere like Wyoming or, or North Dakota, you know, has as much say in how decisions are made as, you know, people in Queens. And, you know, that's this historical phenomenon or anomaly of, of, of the settler colonial, you know, state formation of the U.S. that, you know, it's a, it's a larger conversation about what, you know, what undoing that would mean or so-called decolonization or whatever you want to call it. But I don't think, you know, in a, in a borough like Queens where there's millions of people, I don't know that people in Queens believe that the senators in North Dakota have our best interests in mind. So when you're, when you're talking <laughs> about this, this so-called central government, you're basically talking about these senators from around the country that they don't give a shit, you know, about the local phenomenon or experience. You know, you know, the U.S. is also huge. You know, it's, it's more than 300 million people. You know, it's, 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 it's bigger, you know, it's a, as big as, you know, the European Union, both physically and in a, the comparable population. So I don't know that you would think, you know, the EU commission would be the best person to administer, you know, resources in a neighborhood in Amsterdam, you know, like that would probably be pretty far fetched to you, I would think, you know what I mean? So I think we feel similarly in Queens that we don't think, you know, the federal government in Washington, D.C. is the best organ to sort of administer resources because of how it's been built and developed, you know, the histories of, of racism and classes and kind of, you know, dispossession of, of Native Americans, you know, obviously the enslavement, you know, of Africans. And, you know, the, the, the racial distribution of the populations in New York City, the kind of immigrant distributions, you know, there's, there's hundreds of years, there's centuries of, you know, horror that have that built the, the governing system that, that we, you know, live within and we have to deal with. And I, I'm not proposing a simple solution about how, how we address that. I wouldn't be so delusional to say that there, there's a simple process. All I would say is that local communities, I think, have a better understanding of themselves and their surroundings and are probably in a better position to propose, you know, the kinds of resources they need, which, you know, gets to a broader question about like, you know, representative liberal democracy, which is this incredible mm -hmm. resilient form. You know, it's, it's, you know, there's not really, there's not revolutions against liberal democracies because, they are so resilient and it's so difficult to overcome them. But, you know, there's obviously a lot of inequality, you know, in them throughout the world. And this is one of the contradictions we live within. And again, I don't have a, an easy solution to how to deal with that. All I say is that the local, you know, local self-organization gives you a better lens than a kind of top-down centralized form of governance. I would absolutely agree. I think that it's the same argument that's kind of been bouncing around the, the sphere of management for, you know, a decade or so that, that bottom up management works best, that managers should be there to su support workers rather than bark orders. I think if governance was, was to flip, because in my opinion, government is malfunctioning, if governance was to flip so that the local localism could inform cities, could inform states, could inform federal in order for the best decisions to be made for, for individuals and communities on the ground. Not, again, not proposing a solution exactly as you say, but that is what I mean by, by having a more functioning government or by organizations working with government. It, it's not to centralize more power, it's to redistribute. Right. We want the people or the world or society or whatever to function. And, that you know, I don't know that that requires the government to function. You know, like, I guess that would be this kind of semantic debate. You know, the goal isn't for the government to function. Like, who cares, you know, if the government functions? You know, the government is functioning, you know, aside from our coup attempt. You know, the government is, is functioning perfectly well. It's, it, it's just that, you know, the, there's a, the, injustice and kind of inequality, economic inequality and inequality of, of public health is not functioning. And, 
the distribution of, of money and access to health and education and kind of information is, is not. But, you know, the legislative process in the U.S. is working fine. You know, it's it was drawn up in a constitution and it's followed and there's checks and balances and there's different houses that check on each other. You know, it all works. You know, the, the municipal government in New York City, the legislative body of New York State, you know, it all works. It all functions. No, I, I do understand. So I assume that there hasn't been th that you don't think that uh, a president like Biden is going to reduce the, the need for, for organizations like Woodbine. No, I mean, obviously, you know, it'd be, you know, I could, I could criticize Biden or something, but it's like, it's not, you know, to give, it's not even just him. It's like the way that the way the Democratic Party is functioned, the way the Republican Party functions, the way, you know, the legislative body functions, they're all institutionally designed not to work for, you know, the things that we actually want, you know, we're not going to be able to get a kind of liberatory imaginary horizon through this structure. And the structure works, you know, like a liberal democracy, it's, it's supposed to sort of, you know, neutralize conflict, you know, we're not, it's not a genocidal situation, you know, there's not going to be large famines, you know, there's not going to be, you know, large massacres, hopefully, you know, we're warding off a civil war. And, in, and if you set the bar pretty low, in that sense, you know, the, the, the democratic system is working, you know what I mean? It, it, it extracts money from, from people and tries to redistribute that money. But I think a lot of people are aware that it's just not enough. It's not satisfactory. There's this isolation, this depression, this, this unhealth, you know, that, that is coming out with COVID. You know, I mean, it's kind of interesting, you know, for me, I'm not, you know, a epidemiologist, but it's interesting the extent to which that the liberal democracies, you know, in, in North America and Europe have, have served so poorly with COVID. You know what I mean? Like, it's not as if so-called third world countries are dying at a much higher rate or the death rate is so high. I mean, to be honest, even with the kind of argument of socialized medicine, you know, a lot of the countries, from what I understand, like in Europe, Northern Europe, they're they're not doing that much better than the United States in terms of addressing COVID. And you know, I I can't speculate as to why, but it's interesting. You know, the 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 so-called you know rational achievement of kind of democracy or kind of our economic system has been so devastated by this virus. And I'm curious what sort of lessons are going to be taken from it or how we'll kind of learn from it. You know, it is kind of fascinating to me. Do you think that we can completely compare figures across the board with, with COVID-19? I mean, there are have been concerns from organizations like WHO about the correctly reported cases coming out from uh, non-Western countries. I mean, I think some of the kind of autocratic countries, you know, we can doubt, you know, like Russia or something, you know, the, <laughs> the credibility or legitimacy of their reporting. But I think, you know, the so-called liberal democratic countries, you would think that institutionally they're, they're observing some kind of standards and they're not doing very well, you know, even amongst themselves, you know, with each other, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely the... The UK and the US do seem to, are not seem to be are top of the leaderboard for for COVID deaths and for mishandling, and these are also kind of what you would epitomize as classic, you know, neoliberal uh, capitalist right. states. But even like you know, the Scandinavian yeah. countries, what you would think would be the kind of most rational, they're not doing that great. Like Sweden, and you know, even you know, they're they're not kicking our butt, and even the Mediterranean, you know, European countries are not doing that great either you know what i mean it's it is interesting if you want to make some kind of cultural generalizations about why you know it, it is sort of fascinating you know i think i mean sweet sweden's a rough example because <laughs> they were the, the one country in the world that was like nah no lockdown no nothing right. we're just gonna ride this right. out just go on as normal <laughs> You know, I don't have some strong point, you know, to make. It's just interesting mm -hmm. when we were talking about governance and liberal democracy and things yeah. like that, the ways in which these so-called, you know, rational, modernized, industrialized societies have not been able, you know, to adequately handle the virus. And even, you know, comparing, you know, obviously the U.S. is seen typically as a kind of laughingstock of dysfunctionality. 
but it doesn't appear to us that like Western or Northern European countries were so much more successful. And, you know, this yeah. isn't some nationalistic defense of the U.S. I just think it, it gets to a broader kind of question or inquiry or speculation about what is it about these liberal democratic urbanized societies that have rendered themselves so vulnerable to the virus, either physically, you know, metabolically, you know, socially, in terms of the distribution of resources, you know, the ways in which we yeah. can listen to or trust the media, the government, the ways in which science relates to society and, and the, that kind of level of expertise, so to speak. You know, why is it that we were so ill prepared to deal with, you know, this pandemic, I think is going to be a fascinating, you know, site of inquiry for decades, you know. I do agree. I do absolutely agree. The The West has failed tremend tremendously in its handling of COVID. It does not have the same ability to sanction citizens as elsewhere. But I, I don't think that this could ever be a discussion where we like just focus on, on a couple of data points. You know, like I had somebody say that, that Vietnam was doing really well and talking about, you know, that is an example of a good communist right. state. And then the next day, you know, Viet Vietnam is, the government is disappearing right. journalists. So and China, you know, China actually handled COVID pretty bloody well, actually, when you look at it, except they were silencing doctors. They didn't report adequately to the WHO. They, they put the whole world at risk. So it's like, it may be, <laughs> maybe, in fact, the, the problem is that humanity, man cannot organize on this scale. Like nation states are just too big. A pro Every single nation state is just a, a failed right. experiment. And that, uh, which brings us very nicely back around to Woodbine and projects like yours and what right. we're doing. Or, you know, the, the kind of globalization experience of, you know, s total travel, you know, across continents, yeah. you know, yeah, we just could, we wouldn't be, we didn't have the capacity to deal with the viral implications of that or something. And, you know, but now it's sort of interesting, you know, in, in the U.S., you know, our borders have effectively been closed since March. You know, like if people were already citizens or already had a visa, you know, they were able to come in. But, you know, there's been no tourism. And as far as I know, no new visas. And it's one of the interesting things that's not really spoken about that much. You know, I'm not sure that that's ever happened, you know, either, even in World War Two or World War One or something that our borders were closed to this extent for this long which really affects a city like New York, there's not a lot of, you know, economic activity. There's not entertainment, you know, large entertainment activity, like, you know, sporting events or, or these kind of shows. So it really changed the culture and visibility of the city, which then became much more working mm -hmm. class because those are the people that stayed or had to stay. So they took on a broader vis visibility. And then obviously, you know, the poor, you know, the, the homeless and, and the hungry took on a much greater visibility, you know, not since, you know, the 90s or 80s or 70s when New York was in a much different economic situation. It looks closer to that than it has, you know, the, the last 10, 20 years. Cities like New York became these kind of luxurious playgrounds for the wealthy who had, you know, nice restaurants to go to and nice entertainment and shows and things like that and all that's gone and a lot of those people left so that whole layer of spectacle that they kind of embodied doesn't exist and the city is becoming a grittier imaginary it's you know it's a bit dirtier it's a bit funkier it's it's less safe if we're being honest you know there's more there's more crime it's not all this utopian cooperative communal thing you know that there's more desperation the vision of New York has really shifted. That must be very exciting for somebody who's a New Yorker through and through to see your city reveal itself, reveal its inner workings or have the opportunity to reveal its inner workings because it's those communities that you're talking about, the poor, the working class that make new massive cities possible that make them thrive even though they don't really get get to benef benefit from it yeah for sure i mean you know it's it's obviously a devastating time for new york or the u.s so i don't want to be too romantic about it but it is a major yeah. revealing and 
you know, anytime there's a major paradigm shift, it's exciting. You know, if you're frustrated and, you know, disappointed and angry about how the world or society works, anytime there's a major shift, you have to be a little excited that it, it reveals a kind of opening and allows people to see exactly what was happening or what is happening or how things function or work. And in that sense, I'm kind mm -hmm. of, I'm glad that we've experienced this. And I hope that what everyone has seen and experienced will inform their analysis of, of the government, as we've been talking about, of the economy, but also, you mm -hmm. know, the social life, you know, how, how social life works and functions and the, the need for people to collaborate together and, and share resources and time and kind of help each other. You know, I hope that New York is informed by this, you know, in a lasting way. And I think the question will be, you know, how an experience like COVID and experience like the Trump administration will inspire people to kind of organize themselves to imagine something else and kind of demand something else of their lives, you know, their neighborhoods, their cities, you know, et cetera. Absolutely. Tell me, does Woodbine offer like workshops or something for, for people who are interested in setting up something similar? I mean, not really. In the last year or so, we've been doing a lot more, you know, interviews like this, you know, press, and we've been writing more and, and, and to kind of share our story and experience. That's been a conscious shift is to be a bit more open or transparent or communicative. So in that sense, you know, this is kind of like a workshop, I guess. It's also a kind of form of humility because I'm not sure that we could really claim that we have this brilliant model figured out and this is what everyone should do or try. Yeah, of course. I mean, from everything you've said as well, it's not about having a brilliant model that's copied and pasted and, and people just follow. It's about... I think showing people that alternatives exist, inspiring them, creating a kind of, you know, support network if need be for 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 people to organize and self-organize. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly hope that that's what people take from from this conversation with you, that, that there are projects like this that are surviving even during this time or especially during this time. And that, you know, in such a jungle as New York City, and that if, if anybody out there is, is thinking of doing such a project, yeah, please try for your community. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, to finish up, uh, is there somebody or some organization that, that you would like to platform? Hmm. I mean, I think it'd be interesting to hear from people maybe doing similar projects, but in, you know, not in North America or Europe. To maybe learn or hear more about that. That would be sort of interesting. Okay. Well, I'll take that on board. Thank you very much, Matt. Cool. Thank you. Hey, guys, you can find the link to Woodbine in the show notes. Definitely check them out. They are doing great things in New York. If you like the episode, please share, give us five stars, and leave a comment. And if you want to hear from more people like Matt, subscribe at www.platformenterprise.com. All right, folks, thank you so much for supporting the podcast. I'll see you next week.